Oh, yeah, so our passage today is um, starting at, it's in Colossians 3, starting at verse 1, and that's on page 1184 of the Church Bibles. Um, but I'll just, I'll just pray before we, um, before we get going. Um, oh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much just for a, a really lovely sunny day and for getting us all safely here um, at the church this afternoon. Um, let me just thank you even more that you are a God that has spoken um, and indeed you've spoken to us in these last days by your Son. So Father, we just pray that um, as we read your word now and as we have it preached to us, um, you would help us by your Holy Spirit um, to hear the voice of your Son, Jesus Christ, who leads us further up and further into everlasting life with you. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah, so starting at verse 1 of chapter 3. Um, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now we're going to jump down to verse, uh, to verse 17. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to yourselves to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you, and to curry their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favouritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Thanks so much, Peter. I asked Peter to read a few um, extra verses to give us a bit more context. And what we've got this week really builds on what we had last week about us being a royal family in Christ. So do um, catch up on that online if you didn't get a chance to, to hear it. Here's a fun fact about this passage. It's one of two passages in the Bible that mention curry. <laughs> you can go and find the other one at some other point. In the ancient world, uh, life revolved around the home. Uh, You lived there with your family, probably encompassing several generations and some extended family, and uh, they'd be slaves living alongside their owners under the same roof. These are the sort of domestic arrangements that Paul's addressing here um, in this letter to the Colossians. And what we've got in this passage is really just kind of tip of the iceberg. It's kind of high-level guidance to some of the ways the Lord wants to shape our relationships. We need to look across the whole Bible to get the fuller picture of what God says about marriage, uh, family and work. And I'll mention a few wider bits as we go through, but what's said here is super important. It helps us to live out our new royal identity as God's chosen people uh, in these key relationships. And one more thing before we get down to the um, specifics. Did you notice how many times the Lord was mentioned in verse 18 onwards? Um, it's actually there referring to the Lord Jesus seven times. Uh, the final time he's referred to as master, but it's the same Greek word behind the scenes. And uh, so what we're seeing here is really flowing out of what we've covered in the earlier parts of the letter about the way that Jesus is Lord of everything. You can go back and, and look through the letter properly later, but it all comes together in verse 17, which uh, is a bit of a headline uh, for our verses today. Whatever you do... Whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Everything, all our relationships, all of life, flows from the Lord Jesus. He's our creator, our sustainer. He knows what's best for us. And it's also the case that everything is for the Lord Jesus. He's our goal, our prize, our very life. 
And this reality of the Lord Jesus in all of life transforms mundane, everyday interactions into places of Christian discipleship and service. So Jesus is Lord of all. And so what does that look like in these relationships that are mentioned here in Colossians 3 and into 4? Well, let's start with marriage, verses 18 and 19. We see through the Bible that marriage is a good gift from God. He designed it to be a lifelong commitment between a man and a woman as the place to enjoy sex, as the place to bring up children, as a place to partner together in serving the Lord. And all of this is expressed beautifully in the traditional vows in church weddings, if you've ever been to one. They're wonderfully rich to think about. I went to a friend's wedding a couple of years ago. It's a joyful occasion, as you probably expect. He's very much into his dancing, um, particularly Lindy Hop, which I'd never really come across before he told me about it. I've got two left feet when it comes to being on the dance floor. Uh, but all of his dancing friends were there, and it was wonderful to see all the, the skill and fun uh, at the reception. In, in their dancing, there's a, a lead and a follower, and they use sort of touch and pressure and momentum and balance to coordinate the movement between the two of them. It's amazing to watch. That's the sort of picture that God paints for us in marriage. It helps us to make sense of these verses 18 and 19. If you look down with me, verse 18, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as it's fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So notice where the Lord fits in here. He designed marriage to work this way and say so that's why it's fitting for wives and husbands to relate like this. It provides shape and boundaries to the meaning of these commands. Submission is always shaped by the Lord and his ways so that it's fitting in the relationship. And submission should never be demeaning or leading towards sinfulness because that's not fitting in the Lord. Now, sadly, these ideas have been used to justify a woman putting up with abusive behaviour. And that's absolutely not what's required. We, we should be alert to the fact that abusive relationships can occur in all kinds of places, including in church. Abuse is not okay. And there are sources of help inside and outside the church if you're ever experiencing abusive behaviour. Or if you're worried about others, there are posters in the loos, uh, links on the website safeguarding page. Submission is the free decision, not coerced or pressured, to follow the husband's loving care and direction. Now, of course, the husband won't be perfect, but when it works, it's a bit like that beautiful dance that I described. A liberating thing, a strong thing for a wife to trust God with the outcomes and hold herself open to another to his love and care. Our culture dislikes the idea of submission because it feels like it promotes inequality. But we saw last week the truth that we're all equally part of God's people, men and women together, whatever our background, whatever human distinctions might separate us. From God's perspective, Christ is in all. We're all equally connected to Christ, able to live out our royalty and dignity as people made in the image of God. So while there's a distinction here between husband and wife, there's no inequality. Submission that looks like it devalues the wife isn't true biblical submission, but some kind of distortion. And submission is different to passivity as well. Wives have opinions and preferences and feelings, it goes without saying really, and so wives will contribute to all areas of the married life. Wives will share their perspectives and work proactively to find good ways forward in the midst of the challenges and opportunities that come along in life. There are ways of doing all this within the Bible's framework. And it's worth noting that the command to submit is addressed to the wives as submit yourselves. It's not a command to husbands to impose submission or dominate. It's a free decision of the wife to, I guess as it were, relinquish overall control and make space for the husband's love and care, a bit like a dance partner. And love and care is what's placed on the husband's is their responsibility to love and not to be harsh. Now to love means to understand her, uh, to seek what's best for her. In marriage, love will lead to a deeper relationship as mutual understanding grows. 
Loving encouragement will help her to grow into the person the Lord Jesus wants her to be. Not about squeezing her into the mould of the husband's hopes and fantasies. The husband will always want to recognise and promote his wife's agency and individuality to celebrate all that she brings to the marriage. And there will be differences. These um, need to be acknowledged in, in married life. We're often a complex product of our upbringing and culture and it takes time to unpick how two people brought together approach life and decisions and finances and family and conflict and goals and health and everything else that comes up in marriage. For example, what feels like a statement of fact to him might come across as very harsh to her. It's been quite an eye-opening experience when I've asked my wife, have I said or done anything harsh to you recently? I listened to uh, one guy just to kind of pick up on another kind of difference, telling me about presents. Uh, I don't know if you've um, uh, seen this in, in others or in yourself. He's totally happy for it to stay in its brown delivery box that's um, arrived on the doorstep. But for his wife, if he were to give her a brown delivery box, that would be a big no-no. It needs to be carefully wrapped in lovely paper, preferably with ribbons on top. Now it's easy to get carried away with the kind of men are from Mars, women from, are from Venus uh, sort of ideas. Um, uh, th there is a reason, though, why comedians can make us laugh about husbands and wife and men and women in relationships. If the husband's going to love his wife, he'll want to understand how she's different to him. And husbands need to know their wives well enough to see their strengths and their struggles, to harness those strengths and all that they bring to the partnership and to offer support and sympathy in the struggles. And marriage like that takes time. That's part of the reason why we're holding a, a marriage day here in church in a couple of weeks' time. We benefit from setting aside some time to hear afresh God's vision for marriage and then invest time into proper communication. Now, in our church family and in, in this gathering particularly, there are lots of you who aren't married. Um, if that's you, please pray for those of us who, who are, um, just as we pray for you to live uh, fruitful lives of deep contentment and joy that can be found in the Lord Jesus. Please ask us about marriage and encourage us to keep working at it. And these verses also help us to think about a prospective marriage partner. Is this someone I could love? Not just the kind of head over heels, emotional thrill of falling in love, but over the long haul. Could I serve God alongside them through thick and thin? And then that's a big responsibility to take on. But women, could you entrust yourself? To this man in willing submission? Will he lead you towards the Lord? It's so important that both partners in the marriage share the same faith. You want to have the Lord Jesus at the center of the marriage and that's only possible when you're pulling together towards him. But when a husband and wife are moving together in the beautiful dance that makes up marriage, it's a, it's a cause for thanksgiving. It's evidence of God at work as he brings two people very different together and unites them as one flesh so if you're married here today get your dance shoes on you might not make it on strictly i certainly won't but uh, you can live as members of the royal family bringing jesus into all of married life so that's the first set of relationships that uh, god addresses here in this passage where jesus is at work he's at work in marriage and the second is in family that's verses 20 and 21. Uh, here's what it looks like to have Christ-centered relationships in family life. Uh, look down at verse 20 with me. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, or if you look down the bottom of the page, there's a little footnote, or parents, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. So again, there's the, the motivation and the boundary to this command from the Lord, it pleases the Lord for children to obey parents. But this also means they're only to obey so far as it pleases the Lord. Obedience in good things is a good thing. Obedience in bad things is not what's commanded here. And this is true for children in everything. There's no areas out of bounds. Now, how this works as children move into adolescence and adulthood, no doubt changes. But the basic idea stays the same. Obedience ought to be the default posture for Christians towards their parents. And this 
kind of obedience can be a real challenge if parents aren't Christians or if they're overbearing or controlling. So much of our lives, especially as young adults, is spent making sense of our upbringing and culture. And it's important to bring it all into the light of God's word. And it's worth remembering that parents are human too. They have needs and expectations and weaknesses and frustrations as young adults. We probably become aware of this in fresh ways. The Bible repeatedly points us towards humble acceptance of authority, even flawed authority. There are limits, though, and creating a healthy adult relationship with our parents can be a real challenge, especially if marriage becomes part of the picture too. Leaving mother and father, as it says in Genesis 2, being united as husband and wife, it's a beautiful thing, but also a challenging thing. Now, of course, it's made easier when parents pay attention to verse 21. I think the footnote uh, in the NIV there is right to apply this to both parents, although the husband and father does hold a distinct responsibility within the household. The Bible paints a consistent picture the whole way through of parents raising children who know the loving commitment and kind discipline of the Lord through the way that the parents interact with them. So parental love should mirror the love of God. God's love wants what's best for us, and so he provides the security and boundaries within which we can flourish and grow. He lets us taste the consequences of our actions so that we can learn right and wrong. He points us in the right direction, helps us to walk that way. That's the love of God for us in Christ Jesus. Isn't it wonderful to have experienced that? And parents are called to share that with their children. Now, parents can uh, embitter and discourage their children in a whole range of ways. As a parent, I've learned all sorts of ways I can do it. They can be too harsh, crushing children under unreasonable expectations, or almost the flip side of that, they can be too loose. Over time, this discourages children too. Parents who fail to offer loving boundaries and correction uh, end up teaching their children that actions don't really matter. And of course, they do. Parents can be so busy providing all sorts of expensive experiences and education for their children that they don't give the most precious gifts of all, time and attention. Fathers are probably especially prone to this. There's a reason for our cultural stereotype of the absent father. So there are all sorts of ways that parents might embitter children. And I guess it's a real challenge when a family gradually becomes aware of negative patterns of relating. How can that change? Well, I suppose, first of all, and primarily, it is the parent's responsibility to come back to Jesus for forgiveness, which is always there, wonderfully, for a fresh start. To noticing the ways that perhaps our actions as a family, as parents, are generating bitterness and discouragement. And uh, I suppose that might involve listening to some hard truths from the children. But Jesus wants to make our homes into places of encouragement and growth, places where the gospel is lived out and rings out to others, places where Jesus is Lord and everything is connected to him. I'm conscious many of us here aren't parents. Again, please pray for those of us who are, and perhaps one day the Lord will bless you with children. A church family provides a wonderful place for learning about bringing up children, and growing into the kind of people who make godly parents, people who have the Lord Jesus at the center of their lives and outlook. That's God's vision for family under the headship of Christ, Christ Christ-centered relationships in family life. And then finally, we turn to working relationships. This is verses 22 to the start of chapter 4. I mentioned already a sort of household Arrangements in the uh, first century world, all together under one roof, slaves and owners. And it's worth being clear, um, really clear, that just because God gives instructions to slaves doesn't mean that slavery itself is a good thing. It's kind of the same as um, the, the fact that the laws are in the Bible about divorce. Just because God gives instructions doesn't mean it's a good thing. And it was actually the truths uh, from the Bible that eventually led to the abolition of the slave trade in the 19th century. But what does it look like to have Christ-centered relationships at work? Let me read verse 22 onwards. 
It says there, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you're serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there's no favouritism. So let's just uh, pause there for a moment. We'll come to masters in a sec. The Lord is watching over everything, both the good and the bad that's done. And it is a massive mindset, mindset shift to think that all work is ultimately done for the Lord, not for the human masters who seem to be in charge. Outwardly, a Christian's work looks similar. Inwardly, it becomes an act of holy worship towards God. There's the wonderful promise here of a reward for those who serve well, but also repayment for wrongs done. Now, as Christians, our ultimate destiny is secure. God isn't saying you need to do lots of good work in order to get that reward of eternal life. Eternal life is secure. It's not about the slave needing to do enough to get into heaven. It's more about the experience there. Jesus talk, talks elsewhere about rewards for faithful service. Now, however exactly it works, we know it'll be good. It'll be worth it. So slaves and workers can do all their work with this fresh outlook because it's actually Jesus they're serving. And masters need a big change of perspective too. That's in verse 1 of chapter 4. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. This shows us that human masters are not the ultimate masters. There is a higher master to whom they'll have to answer. And so human masters need to look after their workers. They can't go around doing whatever they want. They should provide what's right and fair for the workers. I came across a set of office rules from a workplace in 1852. Number one, this firm has reduced the hours of work and the clerical staff will now only have to be present between the hours of 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. weekdays. It goes on. Uh, number three, a stove is provided for the benefit of the clerical staff. How forward thinking. Coal and wood must be kept in the locker. It's recommended that each member of the clerical staff bring four pounds of coal each day during the cold weather. So bring your own heating to work. Well, how about this one? Uh, this is number seven. The owners recognise the generosity of the new labour laws, but will expect a great rise in output of work to compensate for these near utopian conditions. <laughs> So there you go. Aren't we glad we don't live in the 1850s? Being a wholehearted Christian in the workplace will always be challenging. But at least we know our boss is ultimately in heaven. And he sees everything we do, whether it's for our supervisor, our examiner, um, our boss in the workplace, or whatever other context we might be working. In our age of work from home, Knowing that we work for the Lord is so important because very often our boss or supervisor won't see all we're doing. So this is a call for our work to be done with integrity and thoroughness, not just sweeping problems under the metaphorical carpet. If we're following this, we'll make real efforts with our work, even if our supervisor or manager seems harsh or discouraging. Having Jesus involved in our everyday lives is such a great encouragement. He knows about difficult bosses and also he knows about difficult employees. And he laid down his life in service of others. He's got a great reward for us to look forward to. It's worth serving him wholeheartedly. But Jesus' involvement in work also places limits on it. Work doesn't define who we are or our level of success. 
financial outcomes and success. It's not the solution to everything. There are things more important in life than the next big exam or promotion. In fact, those things are just cheap imitations. What Jesus has lined up for us is far better than a first-class degree from Cambridge or a massive pay rise at work or any other career goal that we might set ourselves. And when life is hard and feels like drudgery, even then it's the Lord Christ we're serving. And so we press on as best we can. Chances are our work won't be as hard as first century slaves. And it's worth noting as we kind of look at this passage in the round that all the teaching here is focused on responsibilities rather than rights. And this outlook is quite striking to our world. It, it would be very striking to the first century world as well. Masters didn't really have many obligations to care for their slaves, but because of Jesus, they're called to provide for the slaves. And it's the same pattern across each of the outwardly, um, what you might say, stronger and more privileged members of the pairings. Fathers and husbands are challenged in the same way that was really very countercultural in the first century. And in this, the Bible offers dignity to the uh, perhaps outwardly weaker part of the pairing by imposing these huge responsibilities on the outwardly stronger part of the pairing. At the end of the day, both the weaker and the stronger find their truest identity in Christ. And it's worth seeing how at one level we're all called to identify with the, the, the weaker, the more vulnerable partner in each pairing. So Paul makes it explicit to the slave masters. All, even masters, serve the one true heavenly master. In that sense, we're all slaves of a heavenly master. But it's also true, isn't it, that we're children of a heavenly father who we're called to obey. And we're all part of the bride of Christ, the church. And so we submit to him and receive his love. And it's also true in uh, some senses that Jesus fulfills those sort of weak and more vulnerable parts of the pairing. He uh, represented the true people of God, submitting gladly to the divine bridegroom, the Lord God. He was the true child, son of the Lord God, the heavenly father who was always obedient, and he became a humble slave so that he might offer his life to save us. As we come to the table in a moment, we will be celebrating that offering of his life. He was a slave so that we can be free. So whatever you do, whether in marriage or in family life or at work or anywhere else, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let me lead us in a prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus. Thank you that he laid down his life as a slave so that we might receive freedom and forgiveness. Thank you that in Christ Jesus, we are all equally loved, equally part of your people, equally valued. And we pray that in the different relationships we have in this world and the different responsibilities that they carry, that you might help us to fulfill our responsibilities in a way that glorifies Jesus, that is fitting for those who live in his name. Would you provide us help by your Holy Spirit to do that? And would you make us a blessing to those around us who carry different responsibilities? We pray that in this we might all work and live together for the glory of your name. Amen.